Well, I could, I could go ahead and dismiss. We've already had church. Not much more to add. What I am going to add is an admonition to all of us. Would you say we're in a struggle in this world? I don't watch the news. It is never on in my house. You say, well, you're uninformed. Yes, I am. From the dark side, I'm uninformed. I never, ever walk into my house with that blabbing mess going on. You're a stronger Christian than I am. I can't do it. I want to talk to you about the power of atmosphere and the power of your posture. See, life is in a battle. And if you're wearied in the easy times, then we won't make it in the hard times. Right now, it's an easy time. It's an easy time right now. We have gone through nothing. So, well, I have. No, you haven't really. Not if you're sitting here in your right mind. You've already come through a thing. You know, we can talk to some people who live in some third world countries. Talk to some women who lose their body parts because they're a woman and they're a Christian. Talk to some preachers who are beheaded for just preaching the gospel. We've really gone through nothing in America. We're just cushy Christians. We just like our microwave and we need to push a button and get it done. We want to do drive through Christianity. We want to do Chick-fil-A Christianity. And I'm a Chick-fil-A fan. I get ill. I pretty much don't go to any other drive throughs because Chick-fil-A has spoiled me. Because it can be stacked out the parking lot. And whatever their head has told them to do, they are doing and they are blessing you when you come through. You know, their head closes on Sunday too. I always want Chick-fil-A on Sunday. Like, do you have any sinners on your staff that will work on Sunday to feed us Christians who want to eat chicken on Sunday? <laughs> but you go to different places and you wonder why the excellence is not, excellence is not there. Well, excellence flows from the head. And it's, it's, it's based on who you put on your team. See, if we can't praise the Lord in the good times, we won't find praise in warfare. Yet we find these words in Romans 8, 37. In all these things that we think we have gone through, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. See, last Sunday, Pastor talked about fight. You know, and the scriptures, you have to balance the scriptures because it plainly says the battle is the Lord's and the victory is ours. But you can't present a sloppy life to him and expect him to fight for you. When he's given you, the Bible is the answer to your test of life. It's an open book test. There are no secrets there are no hidden answers. You just got to read the book. I used to love open book tests. But see, if, if we're not conquering and winning, then we need to check our posture. You, I found, you know, these are familiar scriptures to you. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But if you are not using the correct posture, you cannot rebuke a principality. You have, you're powerless to come against the rulers in the high, in the dark places. They rule you instead of you ruling them. So, Turn to your neighbor and say, prepare for battle. Look back at it and say, check your posture. So, did your mother ever tell you to sit up straight? Square your shoulders. You know, women are taught back in the, the good old days when we had manners and, you know, you know, a man is supposed to carry himself like a man. Well, I say today, where are the men? There's a lot of sugar in the tea. 
And I love sweet tea. But I love a strong man. And the women said, I want a man who knows who he is, who knows how to handle the dark spirits. <clears throat> My husband even went to a young man in the Publix grocery store a couple of years ago. A really good looking kid with his girlfriend or his young wife, I don't know. But something came over your pastor, and it does often. He left our buggy, and he walked over to this young man. He said, I want to just thank you, sir, for being a man, and shook his hand, stuck his hand out. And the guy went, oh, wow, thanks. Like, in other words, I'm so glad you drained the sugar out of your tea. You just start looking. Where are the cowboys? Where are the stud muffins? Can you only find them on a football team or a basketball team? Where are the women of God? See, you don't want to get me started. See, women play into this culture. Women are the ones who walk around half naked. Watch the beach pictures. She's in two pieces of string while he's in a bathing suit to his knees. We have reached a point in time where we show all of our body parts. Baby, we all have them. Please hide yours. What we have failed to understand is men love the hunt. Oh, they'll, they'll run around with you, but when they decide to settle down, they ain't going with you, baby. When they're looking for a mother for their children and a woman to come home at night, they're not going to choose you. They know everything you have. Nothing about you is a mystery. Because you gave it all the first night. I could preach like Pastor Steve Harvey and tell you, at least wait 90 days. <laughs> so let's talk about your posture. Your mother always said, sit up straight. We now have a thing the doctors call technic. Because our babies are spent over an iPad. We're, we're sitting over computers. If your fingers or your elbows ever hurt, check your cell phone usage. You can have cell phone elbow because of the way you hold that device and you caress that device and you're running them fingers 90 miles an hour. And you're like, oh, my fingers are stiff. Yeah, because you have held them in this position for hours. But see, posture is a position in which someone holds their body when standing or sitting. You know, there's things called power posturing in business meetings. There's power seats in a business meeting. The one that's at the head of the table usually holds the power. One of the ends will hold the power. If you watch people's body languages, you know, if they're, they're bent over and they're turned inside, you get the feeling that they're insecure. If somebody crosses their arms, it means they're closed. But a posture is also a particular way of dealing with something. It's an approach or an attitude. So let's talk about our battle posture. Do we know who we are in the kingdom of God? How many times will we have to be told who we are until we get in our spirit who we are and we begin to posture ourselves in the kingdom, knowing in whom we have believed, knowing in whom who speaks through us, who uses us, who talks through us, who walks through us, and we, yet we keep looking for some outside force to give us a word, to give us strength, to show us what peace looks like. If you're a born-again Christian, peace lives inside of you. If you're a born-again Christian, healing lives inside of you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, deliverance lives inside of you. And anointing lives inside of you. Now, there's different ways for all of that to manifest. But why do we negate and diminish what is already on the inside of us? Why is it that doctor's offices are filled with Christians? I'm not anti-doctors. Have close friends? Respect them. But our medicine cabinets look just like the world's medicine cabinets. 
our sleeping pills, anxiety, depression, discontentment. Looks just like everybody else who doesn't know about Jesus Christ. The fact that he died on a cross and took stripes to heal us. See, when, we, when, when, I try, when anxiety tries to set in, what, is, what are we supposed to do? You go to Philippians. I don't think we should ever have anxiety as a Christian. Anxious thoughts? Yes. We're not exempt from anxious thoughts. But you've got to flip to Philippians that says, Be anxious for nothing. He gives us the test. So what is our battle posture? Do we just roll over and play dead? See, Psalm 144 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My loving kindness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I hide behind. My covering, my refuge. So if he is all of that, what is our battle posture? See, we have powerful weapons in our spiritual arsenal. And our posture of praise releases. We have several weapons in the arsenal. Obedience to his word is the number one weapon in your arsenal. If you know, you've got to know what this word says and you've got to do what the word says. When you position yourself in the word, the enemy is rendered powerless. See, but when the enemy came to Jesus and half quoted scripture, he was so stupid. You're quoting his word. You're misquoting his word. He had the audacity to look at the word because Jesus is the word. He looked at the word and misquoted and tried to convince Jesus that that's not what his word was or what he had said. Wow, dumb. Try another angle. So obedience to God's word. Intercessory prayer is a weapon. Confession of God's word is a weapon. You need to know what his word says, and any time an attack rises or any time an anxious thought arises, what comes out of you, it should be his word. Staying in position is a powerful weapon. Or we just roll over and play dead. But I want to talk to you for a few moments about praise. Because the weapon of praise confuses your enemy. Often in battle, we spend a lot of time rebuking the enemy, and we have the authority to do that. We position ourselves, and we ask God to respond and react on a specific manner, and that's okay. But in the use of our praise in warfare, at some point, we stop dictating to God how he's supposed to do a thing. We praise him for his wisdom and his might. We celebrate him and his power. It's what we were just doing a few moments ago. And in those moments of warfare, we are releasing him to do what only he can do. See, we can keep praying about it and keep interceding about it, but at some point, you're going to have to release a thing to him and turn it over to him and say, I can no longer do this. I, I'm, I'm powerless to handle this. I'm putting it in your hands. And I'm not taking it back. That's where we get tossed around. You'll have to do something to see some things happen. Today I want to make you just a wee tad bit uncomfortable. And I want to break you out of your uncomfortable in just a few moments. Isaiah 60, 18 says, Praise opens the gates of victory. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land. Where's your land? Where is your land? It's your apartment, your condo, your townhouse, your home. The, your desk at work is your land. The school where your children attend is your land. The city where you inhabit is your land. The state in which you live is your land. The nation in which you have your place of being is your land. So you have to define what your land is. 
we have heard pastor preach on everywhere you put the soles of your feet belong to you. So maybe your whole block belongs to you because you walk around your block. Maybe the walkways around your city because you get on the walkway to walk and run belongs to you. You've got to define your land. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. But you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. See, what are the, the walls of your house called? What are the walls of your marriage called? Is it frustration? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it discontentment? Is it sickness? See, you have the authority to name the walls of your house. To name the wall around your desk. To walk around your city and put a wall of salvation around it. To drive to your kid's school parking lot or your grandbaby's school parking lot and say, I declare these are walls of salvation. These are gates of praise. Nothing shall touch my child when they're on this property. Do you understand me? I have just drawn a line. You will not come near what belongs to me. See, we need to get as ferocious with the enemy in our praise as we would if some stranger walked up in our house. I taught in our Breaking Controlling Spirits class last Tuesday night. See, we have problems breaking controlling spirits because if someone breaks into our home, we know they are a stranger. If they announce, I'm here to take over, we're going to have a scuffle and one of us is going to win. No different than if a stranger walked in the back door of this church in the next few moments while I'm speaking and made this, this clarion call to all of us, an announcement, I'm here to take over. There would be a scuffle in this room. If that ever happens, you hit the floor. There are some folks who are armed and dangerous, and they will deal with it. Just find you a place to get, on the, get your belly on the floor and start praying. And let the folks who are commissioned to deal with it take it out. But we have a problem with breaking controlling spirits in our families and in our friends because there is a relationship there so we tend to put up with. Y'all need to be in the school of roar. The way to victory is through the gates of praise. And those who live in victory have learned the access to those gates of praise. You have a two-edged sword if you missed the first roar general session. Dr. Shirley talked to us about a two-edged sword. Great revelation. So I'm just going to piggyback on what she said. Psalm 149, 6 through 9. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment this honor have all of his saints praise the Lord y'all need to act like you have some authority see this is the sword and it becomes two-edged when I begin to speak his word out of my mouth. It becomes a two-edged sword. So what is our role? You put the high praises of God in your mouth. You put the high praises of his word. You put the authority of his word in your mouth. And you, you have a two-edged sword in every battle that you're in. When it it's only becomes a two-edged sword when you step into agreement with what this says. When you step into agreement start living what it says. Then everything looks different. There should be a praise in our mouth and a sword in our hand. Then you need to understand, these are just reminders of stuff that you already know. Praisers go up first. Judges 1 says, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah, which means praise, shall go up. Look, just look at that phrase. Praise shall go up. You never go down when you're praising. You never go sideways when you're praising. It's only one direction when you praise. It's a one-way street. It's a one-way canal. It's a one-way channel. It's a one-way portal to the next world. 
Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. See, when praising becomes first priority, you find yourself walking into new places of victory and blessing. Then I, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. The older I get, the more favorites I have. Genesis 49, 8 says, Judah, which means praise, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. See, Judah means praise and a prophetic anointing. Jacob declared that the hand of the praisers would be on the neck of your enemies. So you don't have to fight the battle. You don't have to rebuke. All you got to do is praise, lift your hands and praise, and he'll put your spiritual hands on the neck of your enemy. What's trying to choke you out, he will choke it out. What's trying to kill you, he will kill it. What's trying to come against you, he will shut it up. All while you're praising. So you throw yourself a praise party every stinking day of your life. You need to spend way more time praising him than you do asking him for stuff. Go back to the, to the Lord's prayer. It started with praise. Petition is in the middle. And it ends with praise. So you ought to do two times more praising than petitioning. It's a simple formula. Look at your hand and say, my hand's on the neck of my enemies. Music is strategic in warfare. You, you say, why do you guys come in here and why do you spend all this time and you rehearse and let's just, let's just come in and sing a familiar song and, and, you know, first, second, and fourth stanzas. I never went to one of those churches. I have visited in them and preached in them. Not many of them. Not many of those churches ask a woman to preach. Pastor hit a little vein Friday. He was asked to play in a golf tournament here in town with some friends, some pastors, and a couple of higher-ups in the Baptist denomination played on his team. So they were interested about this church and, you know, all the things. <laughs> and at some point in the conversation, um, he said to one of them, he said, oh, uh, my wife preaches. And he said, a hush just fell <laughs> on that golf cart. And I said, so you didn't enter on in? He said, no, I just dropped the bomb and hit my ball and went on down, <laughs> went on down the lane. <laughs> Because there's a lot of, um, y'all need to be in the school of roar and take Pastor Charlie's class, Women in Ministry. So you know what you believe and, and how you believe and how to prove what you believe. Isaiah 30, 32 says, every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harps. You know, there's a denomination that says no musical instruments. I have a dear, dear, dear friend in that denomination. I went to a funeral with my mother many, many years ago in a small church that did not believe in musicians. They had people in a choir. And I do remember this supposed tenor on the back row of that choir. Um, they were singing something, and I turned to mom. I said, this is why we have music. It covers a multitude of sins. Because while he was enjoying his musical moment it was painful 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 I'm like please turn on a track get some drums up in here get some keys so not all the mistakes are glaring like floodlights and move the mic out of his mouth please <clears throat> but this scripture says every stroke the lord lays on them with his punishing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his mighty arm. So you wonder why we worship for 30 minutes and 45 minutes and why pastor pushes you to worship 15 more minutes because the longer we worship, the longer he is releasing the blows from his mighty arm onto your enemies, onto your body to heal it, onto your mind to set you free, onto your finances to set you free, onto your life to take you to another level. He's just blowing the enemy 
blows from his mighty arm. Every time you raise your arm, every time we, the beat of the drums is playing, the, the instruments are playing, he's like, I got you one more time. Listen to my kids. I'm going to beat you until you get off of them. Your assignment is up. You are rendered powerless in their life. And we're just praising him. We're just praising him. See, you need to learn how to release a sound in your house. We know how to release a sound in this house. But what sound is in your house right now? Is it just quiet? Quiet is good. But I never leave my home, even if I'm running late, till I go to my TV and I turn on my Spotify and I turn on praise and worship. Because I want every bug that's in the corner of my house to know you're, you're crawling on Holy Ghost sanctified hardwood floors. So get your little dead self over to the corner and go ahead and die. I want every antichrist spirit that walks outside of my home. See, spirits can sense what's in the atmosphere in your house. I want every antichrist spirit, and I want more than that, I want everybody who walks past my house to say there's something good about that house. There's something good. There's something healing, something whole. There's something different about that place. So you need to learn to release a sound in your house, in your car, where you work. You know, what happens with you and your children when you're taking them to school? Our son, Tony, I don't think he's taking the girls to school this year. Tanya is a couple of times. But he always has praise and worship on and teaches those girls scriptures on the way to school. Pastor was taking Josiah to school the other day. His mom and dad were going on a kids conference for a couple of days. And, and he said an Eddie James song came on and he said he just paused the music for a moment. He said, Josiah, do you realize that the music we sing at church and the music that you sing in Kids World and the music that we're playing in this car right now is teaching us who we are from the Word of God? And Josiah said, really? Now, here's a church kid, born and raised in the church. But we learn to take these atmospheres for granted. And he said, I'm going to play this song for about 20 more minutes. And I want you to start telling me, Josiah, what the message to us is. He said, we're, we're victorious. We're more than conquerors. We're loved. So a couple more of the songs, he said, Josiah just began to preach out of the back seat based on what was being sung to him in that atmosphere. See, I know you have frustrating moments with your kids, but learn to change the atmosphere before you send them out into the world. I don't care what they've done wrong. I don't care how angry you are. Change, shift the atmosphere before that child leaves your car because you're walking them into another atmosphere and they need to know what atmosphere is on them. What I love about this is praise isn't for adults only. Has your kid ever opened their mouth and just dropped a bomb in your presence? You're like, out of the mouths of babes. I've said that many times. Here it is, Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. See, what that tells me is that even those who have no battle experience have the authority to silence the enemy. So raise them up right. I could preach three hours on this one, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just hit it and run. Acts 16, verse 25. This is a whole message right here. But at midnight, you think it's dark. It always gets dark at midnight. At midnight, Paul and Silas were hanging out together in one of their houses. They'd been invited to a life group. And they had just stayed too long over the snack bar. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners, there's your key, were listening to them. So they must have had some jail cell buddies. Now I know y'all thought that Elvis was the first master of jailhouse rock. But he learned from Paul and Silas. They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them suddenly. They were praying and just singing to God while they were bound with chains and fetters. 
behind a jail cell that was locked and they could not get out. We really haven't gone through anything. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison <laughs> have you ever praised him till your foundations begin to shake? If you haven't, I hope you do before this year is out. When you learn to, to shake a praise, to, re, to release a praise in the heavens, and the foundations underneath you start shaking, the foundations of destruction, the Bible, I don't have time to preach it, the Bible says you'll be called the repairs of the breach. You'll, you'll restore the foundations. You know how you restore the foundations? You release a, a praise, a shaft of praise, and it will start shaking underneath you. And all that crust will break open, and you'll find... And immediately, because of their praise, immediately, all, <laughs> all the jail cells were opened. What kind of anointing do you have on your praise? Is it just, to, oh God, open my doors? No, I want an anointing that opens all the doors around me. I want an anointing that opens all of your doors. Not only were the doors open, the chains were loosed. So, what a problem. I don't have time to preach the rest of it, but suddenly, all the prisoners, saved and unsaved, believing and unbelieving, their chains, were, well, their chains fell off. Their, their prison doors were open. Just go on. I can't come on. We got to go on. See, Paul and Silas were not in prison rebuking their situation. They weren't rebuking the enemy. They just decided, hey, see, the problem was, if you have a jail cell partner, that was their first mistake, to put Paul and Silas in the same jail cell. Because they came into where any two touch and agree. We're just going to start singing and praying to our God. To our God that we have seen answer us, that we have seen open doors. I don't think they ever asked for the doors to be open. I don't think they asked for the chains to fall off. He, they just said, hey boy, let's praise. Let's have a midnight jailhouse rock. Let's just worship him for a few minutes. And when you start worshiping him, the jail cells will open. The chains will fall off of you. You'll get your right mind back. So they just praise. They just praise. They just praised. They didn't rebuke. They didn't cuss the guard. They just praised. If we're going out, we're going out praising. This is how I'm going to die. I'm going to die praising. Not going my way. I'm going to get out of here praising. I'm going to leave this place. So what is your legacy? See, in every battle, you got to stop asking and stop striving and stop interceding and just start praising him. I read in Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. But here's how you, here's why you can carry out great exploits. Don't ever forget Colossians 2, 15. Having disarmed principalities. Now go back to Ephesians that we started with. Our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in high places. But it's a fixed fight. So why is your posture not? I'm in a fixed fight. Oh, the weapons are flying, but none will prosper against me because that's the heritage of the saints of the Lord. Check your posture. Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers, your God has already made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them so the battle is not yours the battle belongs to him he's already disarmed them and when you get in battle you got to remember his declaration that he taught us on the cross of calvary when he said it is finished so why do we keep stirring around in something in doctor's reports, in depressive thoughts, in discontentment, in financial disarray, 
when he has already said to you, it is finished. The cake has been in the oven. It's already out. It's perfection. Just take a piece of my victory. The meal has already been prepared. The battle has already been won. So what is your posture in battle? I want you to stand with me. And I want us, if it is humanly possible for you to get to the front, get to the front as close as you can. I'm going to give you about 60 seconds. Here's how I want to land this plane. We're coming in for a hot landing. I learned what hot landings were like in Honduras. The Tegucigalpa Airport is a challenge to land a plane in. There was never a time that we landed that my foot was not on the seat in front of me bracing myself. And there was never a time we landed in 14, 17 trips that I took that there was not applause on the plane for the pilot stopping that puppy. Because if he doesn't stop it, you're eating chicken at somebody's house in about a nanosecond. Move in tight. Move in close. I want us to do a rehearsal, a praise rehearsal. You down for that for a minute? And we'll push you out of your shells for just a minute, if you'll let me. You see, this, this team comes up here and they rehearse. They rehearse their runs, they rehearse their endings, they rehearse the bridges, they rehearse the beginnings. They rehearse. These musicians rehearse. They don't just fall up here and know the next chord progression. Now, the Holy Ghost has to help them because Adam is in a huge old season of flow. If you'll watch whoever's on the keys today, it's Jay Garcia, one of my favorite keys players. If you'll watch LeBron's face, you'll see a little something on the side every now and then like, okay, where's he going? <laughs> Especially when he stands here and he's just quiet for a minute and this whole team watch their faces. Y'all y'all have pretty good game faces, you've learned. But there have been moments like, oh, oh, okay. Hope we got some words on the back screen somewhere because we don't have a clue where this man's going, how much of this song he's going to do. We're going to do the words we know or something he's going to make up. Welcome to a season of flow. But you guys, you nail flowing. That's all I can tell you. You just nail it. So I'm going to say on to you guys, flow on. Flow on. So today we're going to flow. I told Adam I want to do a a praise rehearsal with you guys and with all of us for just about two minutes. Is that okay? I want to show you very quickly some Bible ways to praise the Lord and check our posture. So he tells us in Psalm 134 too, lift your hands, try it. Lift your hands as high as you can get them. Lift your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. That's a command from Psalm 134 too. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Let me tell you something about praise. This weekend alone, thousands of people have filled stadiums, football stadiums. Thousands are filling stadiums today, paying huge ticket prices to get in. And they're going to act like fools for about four hours. Some will have their shirts off, their chest are going to be painted, they've got their fingernails painted, they've got stuff on their face, just so their team can win. One of their teams is going to lose. Sad fact of life. Some's got to win, some's got to lose. Good time Charlie's got the blues. There's only one winner in every game. You can blame the refs, you can blame whatever you want to, but some's going to win and some's going to lose. So why is it that... We have a difficult time expressing to the captain, the coach of our life team, who has never, ever lost a battle. Never, never. There's no lose in him. Never lost a battle. Ephesians 5, 19 says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Lord, from the Spirit. You mean I gotta speak to somebody? Mm-hmm. You do. 
You may never have to public speak, but you're going to have to open your mouth and say something to somebody. We sing hymns in this church. We sing songs from the Psalms. He says, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. So I want you to lift your hands as we begin to sing. Open your mouth and sing to him now. How great is our, is our God. God. Sing with me. How Sing with me. How great is our God. And when you sing with me, all the world will see. How great, how great is our God. One more time, just like that. How great. How great is our God. Sing with me. Sing with me. How great is our God. Is our God. How great he is. We'll see. you just a little bit just give me some chords over there Jay with your hands lifted we're practicing now so you'll know what to do the next time you get in a worship setting you know what to do tomorrow in your house you know what to do tonight before you go to bed I want you to lift your hands and with the chords he's gonna just give us I want you to open your mouth and make up your own song to the Lord I'm not gonna give you the words just open your mouth and begin to praise him right now begin to sing your song to him just tell him I love you Lord. Love you, Father, Lord. I magnify your magnify name. Magnify the Lord. I worship Let's exalt his name together. You are mighty. Worthy, worthy is great. the Lamb. Straight out of most oh, soul. Worthy oh, is the Lamb. That, that was slain, slain for you and me on Calvary. Oh, I we bless love your name. Jesus. I worship you. We bless your holy name. You are mighty, you we are bless great. your holy name. You are the Lord of all. We bless your holy name. I bless your name. You are worthy. You I are worthy. Holy is the Lord. I bless your name. Holy is the Lord. I worship you. Lord, strong and mighty. Mighty in battle. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Oh, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Do you know he loves to hear you, to hear your voice. Look in his face and say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. There's nobody in my life like there's no one like you. You have been there through every moment of my life. You saw my end from the beginning. I love you, Lord. So I'm going to lift my voice on the way to work. I love you, Lord. I'm going to lift my voice at my breakfast table. I love you, Lord. I'm going to bless you before I go to bed tonight. I want your praise to be in my mouth 24-7. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. You ready to go further in our practice? I'm going to mess up some of you now. I've lost my back slide. Veronica, I, never mind, I'll tell them. They've got the slide up here. It's okay. 2 Samuel 6.14 says, David danced before the Lord. Some of y'all just got nervous right then. <laughs> but yet, at your birthday party or your wedding, you'll dance with your daddy. You'll dance with your mama. You'll dance with your daughter. Why don't we get tight about dancing with Jesus? David danced before the Lord with all of his might. One scripture said he danced out of his clothes. So I, don't know, I don't want none of y'all doing that. Let's make it plain. Clothing is godly. 
Now it says he danced out of his priestly garments. I think he danced out of his robes of religiosity. That's what I think. Sometimes you got to dance yourself free of some stuff that's attached itself to you. Then let's go a little deeper. Exodus 15, 20. Then Miriam the prophetess. Oh, there was a prophetess in the Bible. Who would have ever thought that? A woman in ministry. Maybe she wasn't in ministry. She was just a prophetess. Y'all go ahead and prove that by the scripture. The sister of Aaron and Moses took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And the, the definition of the word dancing there means spinning and whirling. Why do you think we have movement of ministry in this church? Why do you think we take flags and we worship the Lord with flags? Then I'm going to take you a little bit further, a little more uncomfortable. Acts 3, verse 7. Then Peter took the man's right hand and lifted him up. Immediately, his feet and legs became strong. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. He went into the house of God, walking and jumping. One translation said, leaping and praising God. You say, well, I can't jump, but you can do this with your hands. If you can't spin, you can do this with your hands. So I want you to get us some praise music. We're about to worship right now for about 60 seconds. I want you to dance like you want to dance. I want you to lift your, I want you to put your hands in a jumping position. I want you to get free. Because your team just won the Super Bowl. Your God just won every victim. all the time he and Nadia get up at the insane hour of 5 a.m. to work out that is not the will of God if you come to a church like this you get one good workout at least once a week okay this last time I'm gonna push you I'm gonna take you to Psalm 47 1 just an amazingly powerful don't just read the Word of God read the Word of God your Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. But until you dig in, you don't know the, the types of praise. I don't have time to go over the types of praise today. But this clap means a taqwa. And the meaning for you is, nail it down. Don't just clap your hands. Nail it down. Nail it down. Act like you mean a thing. Nail it down. Nail down healing. Nail down that promise. Nail down your breakthrough. Nail it down. Nail it down. Don't just pedicate. Nail that thing down. The second part of that scripture says, shout. Pastor's favorite. The breath of God is the only reason that you can shout unto God with a voice of triumph. So for about 30 more seconds, I want you to clap it. I want you to nail it down in your life. And I want you to release a shout over what has just hit your life. to get out of here I want to leave you with this so I'm going to go back to 
I'll go back. Okay. Go back. It didn't go back. Forget it. I want to teach you something. Before you go in to get that dreaded doctor's report, why don't you just nail a thing down and release a shout in your life. Before you go into that job interview, before you ask for that raise, nail that thing down before you ever walk in there. Don't, don't pray for it after. You nail it down before you get in there. If your child's having trouble in school, nail their success down. Nail it down. Nail it down. Don't just patty cake with God. Don't just play around. You have God given authority that lives inside of you. So I just came in to tell you, check your posture. Go back. I flipped it again, Veronica. Praise him every day of your life. And he will shake your situation. Go into your job tomorrow praising him. Go into that what looks like a closed door and watch it open. Go in and right, see, you need to learn to dance with your chains on. They need to be able, that's another whole message I don't have time to preach today. But when, when you're dancing and you're chained up, it confuses your enemy. Does he ever hear you dancing with your chains on? When you dance with your chains on long enough, those things will release you and you'll act like a crazy person when they come off. Praise him and suddenly slap somebody a high 10 and tell them, I am a radical praiser and I get radical answers and I get radical breakthroughs. Tell them, have a radical week. In Jesus' name, you are blessed and highly favored. See you Monday for CR, Tuesday for Roar, and Wednesday for Hitched.